Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adina Tari, and I'm a first-year PhD student and a first-year gastroenterology resident at the Division of Pancreatic Diseases. My mission is to improve patient care in acute gastrointestinal diseases, and my mission is to conduct high-quality researches in the same population. Currently, I have uh, two ongoing projects. My first project is about to investigate the influence of papilla morphology on ERCP outcomes, which is a systematic review and a meta-analysis. And my second project is about the resuscitation of the hemodynamically unstable gastrointestinally bleeding patients, which has two parts. The first part is a protocol for a randomized control trial, and the second part is um, its pilot um, study. So now let me talk about my first project entitled Investigating the Influence of Papilla Morphology on ERCP Outcomes. ERCP is the most common therapeutic procedure for pancreatobiliary disorders. However, how to best achieve a safe and effective bile duct cannulation is still a debated question. The incidence of adverse events is still high. For example, post-ERCP pancreatitis has an incident rate of 10% with a mortality rate of almost 1%. Endoscope is doing ERCP routinely recognize the difference in the macroscopic appearance of the papilla. And this has led to a conception that certain appearances are more difficult to cannulate and therefore more prone to adverse events. The first validated classification by the microscopic appearance of the papilla was published by, two, uh, by a Scandinavian research group in 2019. They differentiated four papilla types, and they found that type 2 and type 3 papilla were more frequently difficult to cannulate compared to type 1 or type 4. The frequency of post-ERCP pancreatitis also differed between the different papilla types. So, our clinical question is then, how does the morphology of the major papilla affect by the cannulation outcomes and adverse events? For our study, we used the COCOPA framework. Our conditions were difficult cannulation, cannulation failure, cannulation attempts and time in the context of papilla morphology in adult patients undergoing ERCP with a native papilla. Our clinical uh, implication is to decrease the incidence of post-ERCP adverse events. And our hypothesis is that certain morphologies of the papilla can predict a more difficult cannulation and therefore a higher incidence of adverse events. So we conducted our systematic search in three databases at the end of September, and this was our final search key. And this is the flowchart of my selection. Almost 7,000 articles were identified. From that, 36 articles were eligible for the full text selection. And after the whole selection process, including the citation chasing, 17 articles were eligible for the systematic review. And from that, we can include uh, 13 articles to our quantitative synthesis. And uh, let me show you some of my results. Here you can see the forest plot for the incidence of difficult cannulation. In this case, eight articles could be pulled together, and um, you can see that there was a difference between the incidence of difficult cannulation between the different papilla types. It was the highest in case of type 4 papilla and the lowest in type 1, and these, re these results were statistically significant. And um, this is the forest plot for the incidence of post-ERCP pancreatitis. In this case, we could also pull together eight articles. And uh, you can see that um, there was also a difference between uh, the different papilla types. The highest tendency for developing most ERCP pancreatitis was observed in case of type 2 papilla, and it was the lowest in um, type 3. And um, let's move to my second project, which is about the resuscitation of the hemodynamically unstable gastrointestinally bleeding patients. So, as you can all know, acute gastrointestinal bleeding is a potentially life-threatening event, often requiring emergency medical care. One in four patients will develop hemodynamic instability 
associated with higher rebleeding and mortality rates. However, the recommendations in the current guidelines regarding the resuscitation of these patients are insufficient. Last October, we conducted a systematic search to identify studies in connection with vasopressor use in acute gastrointestinal bleeding. And uh, we could identify only one randomized controlled trial, which compared the conventional fluid resuscitation with the more restrictive uh, fluid resuscitation strategy combined with vasopressor use. And um, they found that the resuscitation time was significantly lower in patients receiving uh, vasopressor. Moreover, the incidence of mortality and the incidence of multi-organ failure or acute respiratory distress syndrome were also significantly lower in the study arm. Our plan is to conduct an open label to an RCT with a superiority study design. We plan to include hemodynamically unstable patients with an acute gastrointestinal bleeding episode. And these patients will receive a combined fluid and vasopressor therapy in arm A compared uh, to a standard fluid resuscitation therapy in arm B. And our primary outcome will be the time to reach the state of hemodynamic stability defined by a new 2 score less than 3 and a lactate level below 2.5 millimole per liter and or a base excess above minus 4. Uh, and first, we plan to conduct a pilot study with 10 patients in both arms to assess the feasibility and to calculate the exact sample size for the trial and, of course, to make further modifications in the protocol if it's necessary. And here you can see my, uh, my plans for the future. I would like to submit uh, my first project to the first journal in February. And I would like to submit the ethical approval for um, the pilot study this month and then to conduct the pilot study during the spring and then to, to submit its results and uh, the modified protocol to a journal in next uh, September. And thank you for your attention. Let the future tell the truth and evaluate each one according to his work and accomplishments. The present is theirs. The future for which I have really worked is mine. I saw already some of your results. Yeah. And um, as we know that the ERCP uh, in the trials and in the real world is quite different. Depends how how volume the center is that is performing these studies. So, and my question is, especially in the, the difficult cannulation procedures, that the outcomes from the big centers that are performing a quite a lot of uh, ERCPs might be a little bit different than in the real world, like, like um, for for example that. Um, in Slovakia or in the uh, Czech Republic, there are quite a lot of centers that are performing ERCP, but not enough volume to be an expert centers. So maybe if you have in your uh, meta-analysis some, some data uh, from uh, uh, national registers, for example, from the Dutch register and so on, and if they differ from uh, the trials that are performed in a top centers from Europe and from the world, because that might be a little bit different. Yeah. It's my point of view. Okay. Thank you for your question. And yeah, like, um, so we couldn't include uh, like um, data from uh, big registers. The biggest trial um, included uh, 10,000 uh, patients, and yeah, it was um, it was a big center, a multi-central trial with three centers, if I remember correctly. But we also include smaller trials, so like I believe that there will be some difference, but um, it won't be significant because of including uh, multiple types of trials. Can I ask that? Uh, uh, have you ever? In this in this uh, field and topic, uh, whether it is possible to uh, measure if there's a so make some kind of regression uh, between the outcome and the volume of the member in the study. 
So it, it may be a possible to solve this uh, kind of problem. Uh, could, have you ever talked about this with a statistician? Yeah, like uh, the studies via B Vatan based on uh, the number of the participants, as I believe. Yes, technically. Yeah. So it would be a nice idea in this case. It will. Okay, I have one more question. Okay. And for the second yeah. uh, protocol proposal, are you going to include varicell and as well non-varicell bleeding? Yeah, we will include all types of gastrointestinal bleeding for the pilot study, yes.